Welcome back to Arcade, I am Super Tommy, and in this video, we're gonna look at getting started with 3D games using 3JS Release 136. We'll end up with this Doom or Wolfenstein or even Chex Quest, if you know what that is, inspired demo at the end with a blaster, some targets, and a way to shoot at them. But before we start, let's talk about references like R136. You'll see it in Stack Overflow or forums and it refers to the specific 3JS release. The latest one as of this recording is V0.136, which would be R136. You can see it referenced this way in the 3JS repository. Solutions for older versions of 3JS may no longer be applicable, so that's what this notation means when you see it. Alright now, we're going to start by creating a 3JS project using VJS. It's super fast and simple. Go to your terminal and type npm init vt at latest, and then the project name, we're going to use 3JS getting started. Hit enter, and then we're going to use the wizard, I'm going to pick Vanilla for either vanilla JS or vanilla TS, which is TypeScript, and we're going to use TypeScript. Now we will CD into the repository here and do npm install to install all the dependencies. Next, let's install 3JS npm install 3. Now, since we're using TypeScript, we're also going to need the typing file. So we're going to npm install at types 3 and we're going to add dash dash save dev to save this as a dev dependency. Let's open up the project in VS Code and delete everything in main.ts and then just add import star as 3 from 3. A 3JS app consists of three things, a camera, scene, and renderer. The scene is where all your objects live like 3D models, shapes, lights, and things like that. The camera decides what objects in a scene will be shown by the renderer. Then the renderer takes both the camera and the scene and draws whatever the camera sees. First, we need to create a canvas element. We can add that in index.html above the inclusion of main.ts. Let's also sneak some slightly nicer styling in. Then we create a WebGL renderer and set the rendering area to be the entire page using inner width and inner height. Next, we'll create a main camera as a perspective camera. The four parameters are field of view, aspect ratio, near plane, and far plane. The default field of view value is 50. The official 3JS tutorial uses 75. I'm gonna go with 60 because that's the default value that Unity uses. There is no right answer, so play around with it to see what feels best for you. Aspect ratio is for the screen, which is going to be the width divided by the height. The near and far planes define the range in which things are seen by the camera. The near plane is how close something is to the camera, so in our example, anything closer than 0.1 will not be visible. The far plane will clip things from the camera that are past that distance. Next, we'll add a scene, and then lastly, we can render it all by calling renderer.render and passing in the scene and the camera. Now let's run the project with npm run dev. What we've got so far is a black screen. Not that exciting, but it does mean everything is working. Let's add something basic to the scene before going into better organizing and structuring the code. How about a cube? Everyone else is doing it. First, we need some geometry representing a cube, which we'll use box geometry for. The geometry are the vertices that make up the shape. Then we need a material to give the cube some color. We'll use the mesh fong material. The material defines how the shape will look in terms of color or textures. Last thing is to create a mesh, which consists of a geometry and a material. These are your 3D objects, so we'll add the mesh to the scene. Before we can really see anything, we'll have to add a light. Let's add a directional light using white as the color and one for intensity. We'll position it at 0, 4, 2 so that it is above and between the camera and the cube. And now we have an orange box. You can play around with the position to see how the light affects it. So let's say we move it down minus 1 on Y. And there it is. You can see the light changes in a little bit. So far, we've put all the code in main.ts, and for a small demo, that is totally fine. We're going to do something a bit more complicated, so let's organize our code into a scene class. Let's make a blaster scene that extends 3.scene. We'll add an initialize method that will handle creating all the objects in a scene. Copy over this code from main.ts. In main.ts, we'll import blaster scene and then create it and call initialize. The end result 
should be exactly the same, but now we have a dedicated place for our scene logic. Next, let's talk about adding a game loop so that we can have movement and interactions. A basic game loop looks like this. First, we take in player input. Then we do our update. This could be our game logic or physics. The last thing we do is render everything. In our example, we've moved all our logic into the blaster scene and rendering is handled by the WebGL renderer. To make this a loop that gets called over and over again, we'll use the browser's request animation frame function. You may see it referenced as RAF around the internet, and that is just an acronym for request animation frame. Everyone knows that acronyms make you look smarter. In main.ts, we'll call request animation frame and pass in a function called tick. Each tick will do an update, then render, and then call request animation frame again. Our update will happen in our scene, so let's add an update method there. Now that we've got the basics down, it's time for some fun stuff. Let's load some 3D models. We're taking this blaster kit from Kenny. It's got a bunch of guns, bullets, just foam though, and targets in a bunch of different formats like FBX, GLTF, and OBJ. We'll be using the OBJ format. OBJ was first developed by Wavefront Technologies for their 3D graphics software used in Terminator 2 and Jurassic Park. Wavefront later became Alias, which released the 3D graphics software Maya, and that was eventually acquired by Autodesk. OBJ files are usually paired with an MTL file, which stands for a Material Template Library. And as you've probably guessed, that is where data for how the 3D model should look is stored. Let's add a public folder at the root of our project and then create an assets folder in it. VJS will handle making any files in the public folder available at the root of the web server. Let's drop in a blaster, target, and foam bullet from Kenny's assets. To load OBJ and MTL files, we're going to use two classes from the 3JS examples. You can import them like this. Next, we'll create a shared object loader and MTL loader as class properties. Now, let's add some targets. We'll make four, and they can all share the same MTL file, so we can load that just one time. Let's delete the cube code and then put this in initialize and make it async. We can call preload since we know we're going to use it. Next, we'll add a create target method that will load the OBJ file. We need to set the materials from the MTL file before loading so that the proper materials are referenced by the object loader. Back up in initialize, let's call this four times to add four targets. For each target that we create, we are positioning them individually and then adding them all to the scene with this.add t1, t2, t3, t4. As you can see, we've got four targets here. Next, let's add a blaster, maybe a big effin blaster. We'll create a method to add a blaster, then we'll call it in initialize like we did for the targets. We'll place it at z equals minus one just so that we can see it. Model is loaded, but because this is more of an FPS or first person shooter, we'll need the camera to be just above the gun as if we were holding it. And if the gun moves, the camera needs to move along with it. To do this, we'll pass in the main camera to our scene via the constructor. Then we're going to add the camera to the blaster and position it in the right place local to the blaster. This looks pretty good, has a doom feel to it. Before we continue, let's take a brief look at the scene graph so that we understand why attaching the camera to the gun will help us here. A scene or node graph is fairly common in games. Phaser 3 has it when using containers. You can very easily see it in Unity. How it works is that nodes can have children attached to them and then those children are positioned to their parents local or node space. Every node still has a world space, but changing position will move a node relative to its parent. And when the parent moves, all children are moved along with the parent. So what happens when we attach the camera to the blaster is that the camera will now move with it when we turn left or right, or move forwards and backwards. There are other ways to have the camera follow the player, but this is the simplest one. The next thing we're going to do is add player input so that we can move the gun around. We'll add some event listeners for key down and key up. We'll use a set as an easy way to store whether a key is being pressed or not. To keep things consistent, we'll take the lowercase version of the key value. So here's how controls in Doom works. Left and right will rotate, up will move forwards in the direction you are facing, down will move backwards. You can hold the special key and then press left or right to strike. We'll use shift. We need a reference to the blaster, so we'll need to make the blaster a class property. For the movement logic, we'll add this update input method. 
First, we'll check if the shift key is not down and rotate the player left to right in that case. For moving forwards or backwards, we need to know which direction is forwards. We can get that by using camera.getWorldDirection as it tells us the direction the camera is looking at. We'll store this in a direction vector class property so that we can reuse it. With this information, we can add the direction vector multiplied by a speed to the blaster's position to move the player forwards. For moving backwards, we can use negative speed. Now for strafing, we move left or right based on what forward is. If the player turns, that left or right is different than before they turn. What we'll do is take the direction vector and then rotate it 90 degrees to get the left direction and minus 90 degrees for the right direction. Then we just move by adding the left or right direction multiplied by a speed to the blaster position. Lastly, make sure we call update input from update. So we can rotate left and right, move forwards and backwards, and we can strafe, it looks good. Last thing is to fire some bullets when we press space. First, let's load the bullet MTL file and store it as a class property so we can share it for every bullet that we create. Let's add a create bullet method and load the bullet MTL if it exists. Then we'll load the bullet obj file. Next, we want to put this bullet at the front of the blaster, so we'll need to get the size of the blaster using a box three. AABB stands for Axis Aligned Bounding Box. Those acronyms. We've got the width, length, and depth of the blaster in the size vector, which we'll use to position the bullet. We'll start with a clone of the blaster position. Let's move Y up a little to match where the barrel is. Then we position the bullet to half length of the blaster from the center of the blaster. This puts the bullet right in the front. Add the bullet to the scene and call this method when space is pressed. You'll see that it puts the bullet in the right place, but it is clearly not rotated correctly. The foam bullet model is pointing up by default, but we want it to match the blaster. What we can do is simply rotate the children of the model like this and then copy the blaster's rotation into the bullet. And there we go. Now let's make this thing move forward in the direction it was fired. To do that, we're going to add a bullet class that holds velocity and update logic for moving. This is a very basic class that takes a velocity and then applies it each update to the bullet model, which is passed into the constructor as the group parameter. After a second, it will mark itself as dead so that our scene can remove it. Back in our scene, we want to create a list of bullets as a class property so that we can call update on each active one. Then we want to create a bullet class instance for each bullet model that we create in create bullet and add each bullet to the bullets array. From there, we need to update each bullet in the bullets array. Let's create an update bullets method and then be sure to call it in the update method. Now we can fire a bunch of bullets and move around. Final thing is to add some collision detection with the targets. First, we need to store a list of targets like we did for bullets. Then we need to add the targets to this list. Then in update bullets, we can check for collision if the bullet is still alive. The easiest way is to use a simple distance square check where we take the positions of each target and bullet and see if they are close enough to each other. This is the same as doing sphere-based collisions and it is the fastest approach. In our case, it is also good enough. For the target that gets hit, we'll just set it to visible equals false and then bring it back after a second. And here's the end result. Now you know the basics of 3JS for games. For more on game development on the web, check out this video over here. There's even more on the Arcade channel.